Hi, my name is Samir Mather. I'm a board certified orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I'm finished my fellowship in spine surgery uh, and started practice in 2006. Uh, I was an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill for several years and subsequently took uh, the job at Cary Orthopedics. I specialize in minimally invasive spine surgery. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, cervical fusion. It's one of the most common surgeries that we do to treat uh, problems with the neck and pain uh, running down the arm. There are several causes that can um, cause neck pain and arm pain. The most common is cervical when you have a disc herniation or if you have a degenerative disc. And the third cause is if you have uh, spinal stenosis. All of these result in neck pain with possible pain radiating into the arm. When we do the surgery, we do it as an outpatient basis, so it's a same-day procedure. We do it at the surgery center. The surgery takes anywhere between an hour uh, to two hours, and by three hours after the procedure, uh, most patients are home. So today I'm going to start with what are some of the causes of uh, neck issues, and then go over an animated video of how do we surgically treat this problem. So when you're looking at the neck, you're looking at a spinal column and you're looking at multiple nerves that run down into your arm. And if you have compression of the spinal column or the nerves, that can lead to neck pain, arm pain, numbness, tingling, and weakness that can run down the arms. One of the most common causes of neck pain is if you have a herniated disc. So when you're looking at this image, these bones are called your vertebral bodies. These grayish structures are the discs that are the shock absorbers in between the bones, and these tubular structures are the nerves that on each side run down into the arms. And these nerves carry the signals to move your muscles and also for pain, temperature, numbness, and tingling. A magnified look shows the disc, and the disc is composed of two areas. One is the center jelly, which is called the nucleus, and then these outer bands called the annulus. And you can see that this shock absorber that we call the disc is very close to the nerves on each side that are running down into the arm. Over time, you can have weakening in these bands called the annulus, and this jelly here can protrude and push against the nerve. And once you get compression of this nerve, you'll get pain, numbness, tingling, and even weakness that runs into the arm. So this is one of the most common reasons why people get neck and arm pain is a herniated disc. Another common cause of neck and arm pain is what we call a degenerative disc. So once again, these are the discs, and you can see that this disc is now compressing down. It's losing its height, and as the disc compresses, you can see that the bones get closer together. As the bones get closer together, as you can see here, you can see the tunnel right here, which we call the foramen, where the nerve leaves becomes less. And the diameter of this canal becomes smaller, so you can see that this nerve, which is in red, is being compressed. And it's primarily because the disc here has lost its height and the bones are closer together. The next common cause of having neck and arm pain is what we call spinal stenosis. And spinal stenosis means that the bones in the back start getting bone spurs. And these overgrowth of these bones, which we call bone spurs, can then compress the nerve as you can see here. So this nerve is being compressed by bone spurs on either side. And this is what we refer to as spinal stenosis. And just like the other two reasons, a herniated disc or a degenerative disc, this can cause neck and arm pain. So essentially, we've now gone through three of the most common reasons why a patient will suffer from neck and arm pain, which is a herniated disc, a degenerative disc, or spinal stenosis, which all lead to compression of the spinal cord and the nerves. I'm going to now discuss the surgical treatment for spinal stenosis, herniated disc, or nerve compression. It's called an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. This is an animated animation of the cervical spine. You have seven cervical vertebrae, and you start with the first one on top, and the last one is C7. Below this level are the ribs uh, in the thoracic spine. The most common areas that are affected are C4, C5, C6, and C7. Essentially, it's the lower cervical vertebrae that we call the subaxial spine. For demonstration of this video, we're going to deem that the C4, C5 disc 
is bulging in the back, causing compression of the nerve. So this disc right here, highlighted in red, is the disc that's compressing the nerve. Once we've identified the disc, we create an incision. So this incision is normally created on the right side of the neck. It's usually about three centimeters, and it's centered over where this disc um, is located on the MRI. After making the incision, we can see here that this disc is herniated and it's pinching this nerve. We identify the disc and we use an instrument called the pituitary, and the pituitary essentially removes the disc that's compressing against the nerve. Once the disc is removed, the pressure on the nerve is released. I use a microscope during surgery, which allows me to visualize the back where the disc is pinching against the nerve and gives me about 40 times magnification of what you would normally see um, with your bare eyes. After relieving the pressure on the nerve and removing the disc, we measure what the normal height should be above and below the disc that we removed. Usually that's anywhere between six millimeters in height to nine millimeters in height. We then take a bone graft, which is the spacer, which is the size that we want, again, anywhere between six and nine millimeters. We then place what we call bone graft. And this bone graft that we place into the spacer is usually from cadaveric bone. We don't take any bone from your own hip. We then place the spacer where the disc previously was. What we want to do is we want to make sure that the bone here and here doesn't collapse down and that's why we put a spacer. We want to distract this bone a similar amount of height what the normal disc should be by measuring the disc above and below. After putting the spacer we then put a plate spanning this anterior part and then we put screws securing the plate to the vertebral body. This plate serves two purposes. One, it prevents the spacer from coming out the front and two, it provides stability and takes away motion at the site because what we eventually want is a fusion. What that means is we want bone from here, from the vertebrae on top to the vertebrae on bottom to have new bone that forms in this area. And so it looks like there's a solid bone mass here and that will take away the pressure on the nerve and offload this instrumentation, which means once you're fused, this screws and plate can stay forever without any reason to taking them out. So our eventual goal of this fusion is to have bone that forms through this area. And once this happens, we know that this area is completely healed and you can return to your normal activities and have no restrictions. I just wanted to uh, show you guys what a real plate and inner body spacer um, looks like. The other was just an animated video. So if I turn this to the side, you can see this spacer in here, um, which kind of holds the bone apart. And this is the plate that we use that we secure um, to the front of the spine. Um, people always are concerned about how much motion they're going to lose with a fusion. The rule of thumb is for every level you fuse, you lose approximately five degrees of motion, which in the grand scheme of things is very minimal amount of fusion. Uh, once again, this is an outpatient procedure for the majority of people. Um, it's very safe uh, and people have excellent recovery. It's actually one of the uh, success stories in spine surgery that we have with greater than 95% success after the surgery is done. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm a registered nurse here at Keir Orthopedic Spine Specialist. I'm with Dr. Mather. I'm one of his nurses here. And next time you come in to see us for your last appointment prior to surgery, I'll be speaking with you about your spinal procedure. In the following slides, you will learn about spine surgery education, the risks, recovery, and frequently asked questions. First off, we have the general risks of spine surgery. These risks are quoted with our own office with Dr. Mather, usually less than a 1% chance. Um, we have infection, bleeding, paralysis, blood clots, persistent pain, dural tear, and anesthesia complications. A dural tear is a nick in a spinal cord sac that the spinal cord lives in, almost like a water balloon. If that is punctured in surgery, typically we can see that happen. Um, fluid leaks out, cerebral spinal fluid, and it is then given a patch during the surgery. Um, that would keep you overnight. We would monitor you and watch it the next day. That is actually the highest risk on this list. Um, again, it is probably less than a 1-2% to chance within our office here with Dr. Mather, um, giving them all a low percentage rate. So we have some questions that are very standard here. Um, anytime we have people come in for spine surgery, we put the top 10 together. So here is that list. When can I drive? 
Uh, we definitely prefer you don't drive until after your first post-operative appointment. That's usually because of pain medications, possible weakness uh, before surgery that lingers after surgery, and just your strength in general. Position for sleeping is always on your back or your side. Um, if it's a cervical surgery, a neck surgery, we want you on your back or your side still, but then we also want you elevated. That will help reduce the swelling. Some people do actually require a brace for surgery. It's gonna depend on the surgery itself and um, the mechanism of your surgery. Will I be in pain after surgery? Yes, you will be in pain after surgery. Typically at the incision site is most common. Sometimes residual pain from um, your prior symptoms are still present as well. We hope that there is some relief immediately, but that's not always the case. Returning to work is very different for everybody. It's gonna depend on which exact surgery you're having and then also the job requirements pertaining to it. Do I need supplies for my incision? Yes, you will need supplies. So most commonly you're gonna need gauze and tape. Each incision is just covered with gauze and tape when you leave the hospital, and you actually won't change that incision until your first shower, and which is the next question, which is standardly about three days. Um, if you would look at that on the slide, it says you may also use Tegaderm with gauze. Tegaderm is a fancy type of tape that um, a lot of doctors use. We like to use it as well. It's a great use of tape. It can be expensive, so if you can find it at a reasonable price, it is worth getting. Also, island dressings. Island dressings are great as well because it comes with the gauze already attached. It looks like a big white band-aid. We talked about the showering. We do prefer three days. Um, some cases you'll have to wait five days, but we would talk specifically with you at your appointment about that. You do need to change your dressing, but only at shower day. So um, at day three, you will take a shower, take your bandage off first, take your first shower, and then put a clean dressing on after that with your supplies that you had bought previously. When can I be intimate with my partner? Uh, generally, we suggest about six weeks. Will I need physical therapy? In most cases, yes. Again, this is one of those questions that is just gonna be pertinent to your specific surgery and recovery. Anterior cervical discectomy infusion. This is also known shortly as an ACDF. This surgery comes with specific risks. All those other risks that I talked about earlier in the slide prior is also pertaining to this surgery. These are just specific to the cervical surgery. So dysphagia and dysphonia, those are fancy words for difficulty swallowing or difficulty with speech, uh, sounding a little hoarse after surgery. Localized swelling, this is one of those things where um, it's more of a side effect. Most people will have swelling in the neck after surgery. It's pretty standard. What we do to help prevent that is we want you to sleep elevated. So we talked about that prior as well. When you are sleeping, it's best to sleep on your back or your side, but elevated. That will help decrease that. Uh, immensely. Esophageal and laryngeal nerve injury, hardware failure, adjacent segment degeneration, and allograft cadaver bone. So these are a couple things that take a little bit of time to explain. Um, I'll go over briefly. Hardware failure, that just means that a screw could actually uh, back out potentially. That's very rare, um, but can happen, has been seen in the nation. Adjacent segment degeneration, that just means that you are potentially putting more pressure on the vertebrae and the discs above and below that fusion. Allograft, that is a word that means cadaver bone. Um, cadaver bone is dead donated bone. There is the potential of it not uh, growing, not becoming a part of your own body, which is really what the fusion part of that surgery is. That's what non-union means. Also a rare risk, um, but we are looking for the cadaver bone to help assist your own bone in becoming and fusing as to one solid piece in the next 12 to 18 months post-op surgery. It's how long that takes for that to happen. The risk of cadaver bone in this case and in orthopedic surgeries um, across the board is theoretically cadaver bone can give you a transmitted viral disease. It's very uncommon, um, actually worldwide, there's never been a documented case, but in theory, um, it's a possibility, so therefore is a risk. This is all about post-operative care and recovery. So these are the top highlights for that type of surgery. This is not a bed rest procedure. Um, that is a common misconception. We encourage walking and frequent position changes as well. And when we say walking, you know, in the first 
week or two, we are actually talking about walking around the house, not walking for exercise. One, we don't want you sweating under the incision, but then um, also two, we really don't want you putting that much pressure on your body up front. You will have a neck brace. All cervical surgeries have a neck brace with us. Um, this is to be worn while sleeping, again, while elevated, um, and while you're up greater than 10 minutes. It's also best to be worn while riding in the car. You will not be driving while you have a neck brace on. Typically after that first post-op appointment, uh, maybe the second post-op appointment, we will release you from that. You may have a sore throat, um, hoarseness after surgery. Some people experience this, some people um, have absolutely no issues with their throat after surgery. It varies. If you do have this soreness and hoarseness, it usually lasts up to just a few days. You can return to your normal diet as tolerated. Again, this is different for everybody. Um, sometimes people wake up from surgery and can eat a hamburger, and some are barely sipping a smoothie, so it's very different. Please remember to take your brace off while you're eating. Most commonly, pain will occur in the back of your neck, in the upper back region, and your shoulders. This is absolutely the most common place for pain after this particular surgery. It's very rare that people have even the slight discomfort at the incision site, which is in the front of the neck. Do not take any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs until advised. These are like ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, Naproxen, Celebrex, all those things actually um, hinder the healing process for the bone. You do not need to change your dressing until you take your first shower three days after surgery. So what you'll do is on day three after surgery, if you've had no drainage, no fever, no issues, and if you do have those issues, you would have called us already. Um, if you do not have those issues, day three, take your, uh, take your shower, take your bandage off first, take your shower, and then do a clean bandage back on top. Please do not use any lotions, oils, creams, or medications on your incision for at least six weeks. This is one, to prevent infection, and two, just to allow the healing process to start. No lifting greater than 20 pounds um, in the initial first few weeks, and also no lifting greater than 10 pounds overhead also for the first few weeks. Returning to work, this is also dependent upon your job requirements. Um, some patients may return to work after the first post-operative appointment, maybe like a desk job, um, something where you can sit and stand at your leisure throughout the day, while others will need a few weeks out of work. This we'll have to discuss individually with your job requirements and particularly how many levels of effusion you're having. Please notify us if you have any fever, drainage at the incision site, difficulty swallowing, or new symptoms that were not present prior to surgery. Preparing for surgery. Dr. Mather and or his highly trained staff is always available to assist with your questions or concerns. You can find that information on the website on how to contact us. You will have one last appointment prior to surgery. This is an appointment devoted to educating you with Dr. Mather and his nursing staff. We will provide further information about your specific surgery and recovery. This is the perfect appointment to bring your questions and your caregiver to. Surgery can be intimidating, so please let us know if we can assist you in any way on making this a smoother process. And for further information, please visit www.matherspinesurgery.com and then follow the links below.